and forever. Isn't it great to be in God's house on this Sunday evening? Is anybody glad you're apostolic, filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name? Is anybody rejoicing in the fact that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and that you have another opportunity to give him praise? Remember December the 12th and 19th, Sunday evenings, 6 p.m., we'll be having our musical drama for this Christmas season, Hope Has a Name. How many of you know that name? Jesus. And we would love for you to be here, both services, and not just choose whichever one you want, but bring people. That's what the whole thing is about, is for you to have the opportunity to invite your friends and family members that may not would not come otherwise, but that would be a great opportunity for them to come and be a part of this great celebration of the life of Jesus and the truth of the incarnation, God manifest in the flesh. And how many of you are grateful that Jesus came to this earth to bear our sins and now we're redeemed because of what he did? Is he wonderful or what? Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? And then on December the 24th, we're going to be here on Christmas Eve having a children's production. The children are going to sing, and people really enjoy that. So invite individuals to come out and hear our wonderful children worship and praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 25. Verse 24, the parable of the talents. Very important parable for us to understand because it does involve each and every one of us. I'm so thankful to God for what he's given to us, but yet I want to be fully aware of my responsibility of what I need to do with what he has given. To whom much is given, much is required if the word of God is true. So therefore, I want to know how can I take what God has given and use it for his glory to where it multiplies according to his plan. God has a plan for every talent he gives and latent within that talent is the ability to multiply, to grow, to increase. And that's what God's plan and purpose is. Then he which had received the one talent came. And you can't excuse yourself because you only got one and somebody else got five. You can't get mad at God and say, why didn't you make me a five talent, brother? Why did you have to give me a one talent? But what you don't understand is that one talent latent within it has the energy to produce a hundred more of its kind. The fact is, in the right environment, employed in the right purpose, it could outdo the man with five talents. Because it's not how much you've got or how little, it's whether or not you're putting into action what you already have. And like Brother Stone King always says, you've got it, you've got it. You've got it, church. We've got it in this hour. Do you realize the talent that you have? Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. And lo, there thou hast that is thine. Now notice... He's claiming God to be a hard man. He said, this is what I know about you. How did he know all of these things about his master and his God? How did he know this? Church, it's so vital. Listen to me very carefully. You have to choose your concepts wisely. Because if you don't choose the right concept, that concept will cause you to act in such a way that will defeat you rather than make you victorious. Your concept about God is greater than your, what you believe to be the doctrine. It is greater than what your family is to you. It is greater than any value system you say you have. 
Your concept is what you're going to live out and act out. It has power to literally put its tentacles and its tendrils all around you and ensnare you before you ever even realize what has happened. That's what happens to people who become addicted. They think they can handle it, but they can't because they're living out a concept that binds them rather than releases them. And I want you to choose concepts wisely. And I was afraid that was the first mistake. And then he went and hid the talent in the earth. And there thou hast that is thine. Here it is. I'm going to give it back to you, Lord. His Lord answered and said, Well, thou wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sow not, gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, give it to him with ten talents, for unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye this unprofitable servant in the outer darkness. That's why I want you to know about this. Say, so why do you want me to choose my concept? Because verse 30 does apply. And cast ye the unprofitable certain into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want that to happen. So I want us to choose our concepts. Your viewpoint of God's going to shape how you react and respond to him. And so we need to make sure that we do it right in Jesus name. Would you lift your hands? Would you bless the Lord? And would you give him praise, glory and honor for his goodness? Go ahead, lift up your voice. There's a ring in it, there's a ring in it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. How many of you truly want to advance in the kingdom in 2022? How many of you want the church to advance? Does anybody want to go forward? I mean, did you just wake up this morning and say, I want to go backward? I want to go backward into the past. I want to go 30 years ago. No, I, I know and understand the sentimentality of that, but I also know that we can't go back, but we don't need to get stuck where we're at. We need to move forward. Is anybody ready to move forward? I want to advance. Well, you need to allow God to change some things. First of all, you need your concepts to change. Your view of God, your view of the church, your view of preaching, your view of what you truly believe needs to be altered and shaped by God. Your climate needs to change. Your climate is created by two things, your words and your relationships. What you say and how you say it creates the climate and whether or not your concept's going to live or die, whether it's going to take root or whether it's going to die on the vine. You've got to have the right words. You can't speak one thing at church and another thing in the home. you got to speak continually the same. That means you got to learn how to control your tongue. It means you got to learn how to control your attitude. That means that you've got to learn how to employ controls on that very one member of the body that can get you into more trouble than anything in the world. And that is your mouth. And you've got to speak words correctly. And you've got to watch your relationships because your relationships can affect your concepts. You've always got people speaking into your ear and gnawing on your spirit and gnawing on your mind with their doubts and their this and their that and the other. Relationships create climate, so you've got to be able to know who you can go to and who can be a faith buddy and speak things into existence. God also needs to be able to alter your creativity. God, you have to be able to end things and start new things. You got to be able to say this era is over and I'm never coming back to this time. I'm never going to this again. I'm going to start a new path and I'm going to create some new things. You got to be able to do that. You must acquire faith. You must acquire focus. You must acquire fire. Without faith, without focus and without fire, you will not be able to advance in the kingdom of God.
You got to focus on what you want. You got to have fire in your spirit. You got to have faith that God's going to come through. Why sit there and be the same old attitude all the time and say, this is just the way I am and there's nothing I can do to change it. That's the biggest lie that hell has ever told anybody. Everybody here can end the old and start the new if you've got faith in the power and the glory of God. I say we ought to focus. Somebody ought to get intentional. When you come to church, don't wait for somebody to do something for you to get you in a mood to praise. I want you to have the intention in your heart. I will praise the Lord. God's talent that he's given to every one of you. How many of you have the Holy Ghost? I mean, you claim it. (laughs) Let's say that again. I don't want you to lie in the house of the Lord. How many of you claim to have the Holy Ghost? Well, within that talent, within that ability is the divine identity and energy to produce anything that you can ask or think according to the text. But no matter what your talents are, no matter how powerful they may be, your concepts will trump your talent. A concept has within itself the energy to propel you into a lifestyle that you may not want once you're ensnared by it. People who have an offense or an unforgiveness, that concept will eventually paralyze their talent. There's no way I can forgive that. There's no way I can overcome that. Their concept will overcome their doctrine. That concept will overcome the Holy Ghost that's in you. That concept will paralyze and shut down the energy of the talent. If there's any point in your life where you say that what has happened to me here is greater than the blood of Jesus, then you are already messed up. Because here's what I know. You don't live out what you say your doctrine is. You live out your concepts. That's the reason why you got to choose it correctly. And we need something to get a hold of us that will change our concepts about we still need a pastor. We still need a church. I mean, I've had people look me in the eye. I still have a relationship with God. I don't need to come to church. God visited me and told me I don't need a pastor. I don't need a church. Whoever visited you and whatever spoke to you was lying through their teeth. And that was not God. That was a fabrication out of your own mind. Because you still need preaching. You need worship with God's people. And you need holiness in your life. You might be a good person, but if you think and you say or you allow other people to tell you that it don't matter what you do on the outside, it's what you have on the inside that really counts. They are lying through their teeth because it matters what you do on the inside. It matters what you do on the outside. It matters what you do in church. It matters what you do in the home. It matters what you do on the job. It matters 24-7. Why don't we just make up in my minds, I'm going to be a worshiper, I don't, and nobody's going to talk me out of it. My concept is a concept of worship. Somebody just needs to get mad at the devil and rise up and say, I'm going I'm to get with the preacher. I want preaching. Preach to me, preacher. Preach to me up in here. Tell me what I need to hear, even though I don't want to hear it. Come on now. You know somebody needs to get up in your grill every once in a while and shake your tree and knock some fruit off the the branches. You need somebody to preach to you. It is true that things can gradually happen to you that go undetected, that before you know it, they have a grasp in your spirit and in your concept. It's a stealth operation that can be very dangerous, and once you realize it, it can be too late. Hosea said gray hairs are on the head of Ephraim, and he knew it not. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knew it not. And Job said it's the continual dripping of the water that wears on the rocks. It's that continually listening to voices that are bitter, spoken out of error, out of the wrong viewpoint and the wrong concept that they have of things that can finally get down into your spirit. And before you know it, you're sitting there judging everybody else instead of looking in the mirror and repenting yourself of that concept that is an error against the Lord. 
So you have to make the choice. You don't have to be ugly to them, but you need to make the choice. I'm not listening to that any longer. You don't need that gradual dripping of those circumstances, unconquered emotions that builds in you a concept that's not scripturally based and it's not pleasing to the Lord. It can be a real struggle in your life and you don't even realize that you're winding a chain around your worship and your heart and if left unattended, it'll become your tomb and your prison from which you will never experience a breakthrough because that concept is debilitating and it's paralyzing and it will keep you from your destiny and it will cause you not to realize the multiplication that's in the talent. This church ought to be growing and multiplying. We ought to fill up every empty place. We ought to give Get so excited about what God is doing that nothing in our past, nothing that we fear in the future are to keep us from the destiny of what God has purposed in us. I'd make up in my mind, I'm going to be a worshiper. I'm going to be a word man. I'm going to get in. Preach to me, preacher. I think somebody ought to just jump up and say, preach on holiness. Tell me what I need to do to be saved. Preach on worship. I need to learn how to worship. Preach on paying tithes. You say, Brother Kinsey, why do you want me to pay tithes? Well, Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, then I be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Your focus is going to determine how much light you have. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. And if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Why are you saying this? Because nobody can serve two masters. Listen to me. There is no way you can love two at the same time. The Bible is clear. You will either hate one or you will love the other. You will hold to the one or you will despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. So that's the reason why I give. Because I don't want money to get a hold of me. I want Jesus to have full control of my life. I think everybody here needs to awaken in the morning and take authority over your thoughts and your words for the day. You need to say in Jesus' name, I'm going to have the right concepts. But you can't just be a giver and then resent what you're giving and then get mad at everybody because you're giving. You ought to give because it's the blessing of the Lord upon your life. The greatest thing I've ever done has been a giver and you do it with the right spirit. Come on, y'all need to smile while I'm preaching about money. You ought to just be so thankful that you're not caught up in all the things of this world. You ought to be able to give and to give with rejoicing. You ought to be able to give to your preacher. You ought to be able to give to the missionary. You ought to be able to give so the gospel can go all over the world. We give to people all over the world, people that are in the most dangerous situations you can be in, but they don't mind. They're not afraid because because their concept is God knows what he's doing and God can use me even in the most dangerous of circumstances and I want to give so that they can go and be the person that God wants them to be. You need to gird up your mind and make up your mind these false concepts are no longer going to rule my thinking. You're listening to the wrong voices. There are people that are bitter in their spirit and they're speaking into your life. Even your closest friends and members of your family can get that way. It doesn't mean you cut them off. It just means you guard your mind. You guard your mind. They will alter your concept. They'll alter your concept of a pastor. They'll alter your concept about prayer. They'll alter your concept about worship. They say, we don't need to worship like this. You don't need to get all excited about Jesus. We can do better than this. This is something that we can do. And it's all these quiet churches that aren't coming back after COVID. Oh, I didn't get a witness. I said, it's all the quiet churches, including apostolics that are not coming back after COVID. I want to say that one more time. They're struggling to get back after COVID because they're scared to death because they've been quiet so long. Their concept of paralysis. 
I refuse to have the concept of silence in the church. We need somebody that'll make a joyful noise. I want somebody to rattle the devil's cage in this house. I want somebody to shake those chains. I may not be able to break them myself, but he's going to hear me rattle them. He's going to hear me come against his stronghold with everything I've got because I need a preacher that knows how to preach. I need somebody to tell me what I must do. Quit telling me the prayer room don't matter. Quit telling me that I don't need to pray. And quit telling me you're praying. I pray every day, Brother Kenzie. No, you're just asking God to be your Santa Claus. And that's not prayer. You want a Santa Claus for a God. Well, I just... Blew your concept of prayer right out the window. Somebody needs to cry out. Somebody needs to intercede for all these lost souls. You say, well, they're my friends. The truth of the matter is they are not your friends. If they're trying to talk you out of worship and the concepts that have made the apostolic church what it is. Now, notice this. Remember when Abraham was told by God that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? What did Abraham do? He started to intercede. How many of you remember his intercession? If there's 50 righteous, will you spare the city? 45, 40. He got all the way down to 10. If there's 10, I don't know why it didn't go down to one. But he interceded long enough for God to send an angel to get Lot and his wife and two daughters out of Sodom. At least he had prevailed in that. Now Lot's wife turned back. Remember Lot's wife, Jesus said in his parable to the church and to the people of his day because she turned back. And when she looked back, she turned into a pillar of salt. He and his daughters fled onto the mountains there to be preserved in that hour because of Abraham's intercession. But something began to change in the Jewish thinking and concept. And, and you know, th this business, do y'all remember the Jews? They said that it's unlawful for us to go into a Gentile's house. That's not in the Bible. You can't find it anywhere in the Torah where they're not supposed to go into a Gentile's house. They changed their concept of why they existed. Do you remember when Jonah was called by God to preach to Nineveh? and he was fleeing to Tarsus. God had to send a storm. They cast him overboard. The whale got him, then belched him out on the beach. Then everybody saw how he got there. And they said, we need to listen to this brother. <laughs> With seaweed wrapped around his head, they said, we need to, <laughs> we definitely need <laughs> to listen to this brother. Whatever he got to say, you ought to see how he got here. And so, but something was lost because he's on a hillside after he had preached for 40 days and 40 nights, praying for judgment rather than salvation. And when you're praying for vengeance on your enemies, something has eroded in your concept. When all you want to do is see somebody get zapped and see somebody get the what for. And see somebody get what's coming to them. And when your spirit is ate up with that kind of concept, it paralyzes the energy of the talent. Because God didn't give you the talent to judge anybody. God gave you your talent in order for you to be redemptive in your efforts, in your praying, in your worship. I'm trying to reach people, not condemn them. 
Somebody's got to keep talking the right concepts. That's what eroded in the lives of these Jewish people and they lost their spiritual power of redemption because their religion no longer had the ability to redeem. They weren't about preaching repentance. They weren't about preaching deliverance. They weren't about preaching the re reconciliation of God. They were about their own vengeance and their own identity and their own personality. And that's what happened and that's why their religion eroded. That's the reason why Jesus came and stood against the Pharisees. Church, we can't stop talking about Jesus. May I plead with you, don't stop talking about doctrine. I'm going to say it again. Don't stop talking about the name. Don't stop talking about one God. You ought to talk about it in the morning time. You ought to talk about it in the noon time. I'm so glad I believe in one God. There's only one God. Somebody ought to, need, ought to begin to praise God for Jesus' name baptism. Oneness of God. You ought to talk about it all day long. Somebody ought to talk worship. We ought to talk praying in the altar. We ought to talk somebody getting the Holy Ghost. Those kids getting baptized, that's treasure to me. I said that's treasure to me. It may just be old hat to you, but that's the best thing that can happen to me in a day is to see somebody go down in the wonderful name of Jesus and come up out of the water speaking in other tongues. Somebody tell me how good God is. I'm tired of hearing some people bellyache. I want to know, has anybody got faith that God's going to move in 2022? Please talk about it. Please get a concept of speaking about it. Talk about praise. We need more of God, not less of him. So you've got to understand that your concept shapes how you receive preaching. And when you get into the habit of missing church, it gets easier as you keep on missing. Now let me show you another instance you're not as familiar with in the scripture to show you how Jewish thought began to erode through the years. If you remember Gideon, how many of y'all remember Gideon with the 300 brothers? With the little trumpets and the little lamps, a little light inside the little vessel there, and he blew the trumpet, broke the picture, and then the light shined and discomfited the enemy and whooped all them Midianites. Wow, hallelujah, is God good? Somebody jump up and say, we can do it. Now, I never understood it, but it's, it's here in the text. Gideon called on Ephraim to help him against the Midianites, but they refused to help. And they said, we don't want to get involved. And then, because they didn't expect, and the reason why they didn't help him, because they thought that he was going to lose. And when, when he won the victory, the Ephraimites said, why didn't you call us to help? I did. <laughs> That's what it says. But you didn't come. I asked you to come to the fight. If you get a comfort concept where everything is judged by how comfortable it is, and you got to pre-know whether or not you're going to win the fight before you come to the battle, you're going to end up on the losing deal every time. Now, it would have been all right if Ephraim said, hey, I'm sorry, I should have come helped you. I didn't expect you to win, but yet you did, and I'm rejoicing in the fact that you won. But they couldn't even rejoice. Not only did they not want to fight to help them win, they got mad at them because they won. Now, these Ephraimites, I mean, they, they were trouble because Jephthah, if you remember, as you continue in Judges and you kind of learn how it all works together, Jephthah was over Israel and he was ready to fight the Ammonites and he called on Ephraim again to help him fight. And Jephthah asked Ephraim to block the passageways. But Ephraim said, no, not only are we not going to fight, we're going to stop you from fighting because we feel that most likely God's going to give you the victory and I'd rather, I'd rather you die that have the victory. That happened in scripture. Do you realize that they had to fight the Ephraimites? That's whenever they, they used the, the language shibboleth. 
They, they couldn't say Shibboleth, they would say Sibboleth because they didn't have the language of faith. And if you don't have the right language, Psalm 78 said, Ephraim was armed with bows and arrows but turned back in the day of battle. That means their, their tools or weapons of choice in this battle was to hide themselves in trees and in caves and on the mountains and shoot at their brother as their brother was trying to win victory over the enemy. That's the erosion that happens in Pentecostal thinking, in Israeli thinking, that will paralyze our talents. Not only am I going to fight for my brother. Not only am I going to fight for your families to come back. Not only am I going to fight for your victory when you're down and you don't feel like you can go another mile. I'm going to tear up any Ephraimite that gets in my way. Brother, I want to know, do y'all know how to say shibboleth? Somebody better get the language. What's his name? You better be able to say it. I'll come after you with a two-edged sword. Woo! I'll start swinging up at your head. Not only am I going to fight, even if I'm assured I'm not going to win, I'd rather fight on the right side and lose than to try to stop somebody else from having what God wants them to have. My, my, my. Woo! I'm preaching all up in here. Don't you get in the way of anybody that wants to dedicate. Don't you get in the way of anybody that wants to have holiness in their life. Don't you get in your kid's way. Y'all not going to like me when I say this, but I'm going to say it. When your kids want to come to church, you better get your sorry, lazy carcass up off the and bring your kids to church. I told you y'all not going to like me. But I'm going to tell you, I said you need to get your lazy carcass up off the couch and bring your babies to this church. Well, it's too much work. It ain't that much work. You got gas in your car. It runs at 60 or 70 miles an hour. You can get here in five minutes. And if you're me, it's three. I'm confessing up in the house. You ought to be here every time the doors are open that you can be. We understand when there's times. We got too many people in the apostolic church that want to just come to church and be fed. I want to know, did anybody show up to fight? Well, I'll fight on Sunday night, but I'm not fighting on Wednesday night. I'm too tired. I'm going to give it my last bit of energy. We need people that are willing to fight. We need people that are willing to say, get up out the way, Gary. You in everybody's way. Come on, get up out my way. I got to get victory over the Ammonites. If you don't want to live holy, I do. And we, gotta, we need people who are willing to fight it through and have victory. We have the power to turn people toward God and to help them find true salvation. Our words, our teaching, our talking, our speech can make all the difference in the world. When you understand the right concepts, you can live them out with victory. The best investment you're going to make is the work of God. I've proven this all through my life. I have given to God all of my life. You cannot. You cannot. I don't know how to. You cannot. How do I say it? You cannot. You cannot outgive God. When I go to judgment, I'm not going to owe God anything. <laughs> Tithing is not a money issue. It has and always will be 
a faith issue. See, why are you preaching on this? Because there's a blessing that will come on you if you learn to give that nobody can stop. There's people that don't even come to church and don't even believe this message that give to this church because they understand that the blessing that's on them is because they are givers. You got to build the concept of coming to church. Say, well, why do I need a preacher and a pastor? Just tell me that. Because he helps to shape your concept. Now, you say, well, okay, I I really do like a preacher. Okay, well, then let's just test that now. You remember David? Y'all remember him? Whenever he said, I want to build a house, I'm living in this house of cedar and the house of God's intents, and I I just don't feel right about that because I built this great monstrosity unto myself and I need to build the house of God. And so he calls Nathan the prophet, and Nathan the prophet comes in and says, yeah, go ahead and do it. That's a pretty cool thing. I think God's fart, let he's going to bless it, go do it. And then God gave him a dream that night, and he had to come back. You know, it, have you ever told your children yes and then had to turn around and tell them no? Has anybody paid for that dearly? You see, you can, you can say you want to preach it all your life, but unless God can switch it from yes to no in an instant, you don't want it. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. That's how you know. I want to preach it. Yeah, preach it. Till he tells you yes, then turns around and says no. And yes, there's precedent in the scripture, and God did not rebuke Nathan. God didn't rebuke David. He just told him no. If you believe that holiness is to please the preacher and the church, that's the wrong If you think doctrine is divisive and holiness is bondage, you're going to live your life in complete rebellion. I know people whose life is in ruin and they cannot perceive it was their concepts that have destroyed them. It wasn't anybody. It was their concepts. Well... I just want to straighten out the concept. Holiness is beautiful according to the text in the book of Psalms. I'm going to worship God in the beauty of holiness. The most beautiful thing in the world is our holy ladies and men that have decided I'm going to live my life separated under the Lord. If you think doctrine is divisive, think again. Doctrine is what's going to save us in the end, and I have to preach it to save myself, and doctrine's the only thing that's going to save this church. You got to know what you believe. You got to know who you believe in. And you got to know why you believe it. Somebody needs to get in the book and find out whether or not what we're preaching is the truth. Holiness is not bondage. You're not in bondage because there are places you don't go and there are things you don't do. God has to be able to tell us yes or no. I don't like the no any more than you do. But I don't want the yes that's going to destroy me either. Because I have watched people walk through open doors that I knew God's yes, and it was not God's yes. It was their own fabrication of their own imagination, and it destroyed them. And I don't want that to happen to you. Well, you're not going to like this either. It's disrespectful. I understand mama's having to take kids out of church. I understand people that have physical issues. We have no problem with you. Walk out when you need to. But when we've got kids and people walking out for no reason. When we got people on their phones texting and trying to take notes to find out what they're going to do tomorrow. It's disrespectful and you're just dissing the preacher. I know what you're doing. I don't mind you using all your electronic gadgets to get scriptures or take notes. I think it's all fine. That's all good. I'm not referring to that. You know what I'm referring to, playing Candy Crush while I'm trying to preach. 
Well, your message ain't that good. Well, you ain't that good at Candy Crush either, so just stop it. <laughs> Hallelujah. You done lost, you done lost all that. You, you, you're ignorant. I said you're ignorant. Put it up. Start worshiping. Get involved. Well, he's preaching Acts 2.38. Well, that's what I'm supposed to preach. What do you think I'm preaching? Well, I've heard it before. You ought to get with it. I don't care if this is the thousandth time you've heard it. I don't need to preach something new. I need to preach something that will save somebody. I don't need to float your boat. I need to preach something that will change somebody. Woo! Hallelujah! You ought to be excited about it. You ought to be thankful for it. You ought to give me at least a look of an amen. If you can't say it, people without a pastor and without a church develop destructive concepts. And when you praise them for their ignorance and you get with them and say it's all right and back that up, you become an accomplice to the murder. Because they're not all right. And it's not all right for you to buy into the concept. When I went to camp meeting, I put everything I had in it to make it the best that I could make it. Even though I had a very small part in what I did, I did it right and I did it good and I did it the best I knew how to do it. But people made fun of me and reproached me and said all kinds of ugly things about me. But there's one thing it did not do. Stop me. <laughs> I wish somebody's would, soul was would set on fire. And I don't care what anybody, oh, we don't need all this and we don't need all that. Yes, we need every bit of it and then some. I'm probably not doing it good enough. I think I'll preach more on one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. God was manifest in the flesh, preached unto the Gentiles. That God is Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh. I think I'll preach Acts 2.38 just to aggravate you. Repent ye therefore and, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody needs to be baptized. Everybody here needs to get the Holy Ghost. Woo! I'll tell you what, you know you're preaching when you got people in the back row shouting. Amen. Now here's what I know, and this is my final point and I'm done. You got to have somebody to help you shape your concepts. Not one time, every time. Because when you choose a concept, you better know where you got it from. And you better know the end result thereof. I've had Pentecostal preachers try to talk me out of my prayer life. I've had preachers try to talk me out of fasting. I've had preachers try to talk me out of the word. You don't need to do that. You don't need to spend all that time. You don't need to do that. Where are they now? I'm not going to go down the list and tell you where they're at, but I promise you wherever they are, you don't want to go, and I'm certainly not going. I'd rather be where I'm at. And here's the good thing. I want to take you with me because we're going to go and advance the kingdom. I said, we're going to advance the kingdom. Just keep on running your mouth. I'm going to stay with the concepts that I know work. Yeah, and I'm going to get bashed because of the rule of five. I've had them do it. Get me to get up and talk about it, then turn right around and tear me down for it. I mean, right there. And I said, dear God, I came all this way. 
and said all of this just for them to tear it down after I said it. They, told me, they asked me to do it and then just turned around and I said, dear goodness, Brian, are you the dumbest thing that has ever walked the earth? But you know what? You never know who you're going to reach. That witch that picked up that made for more book in Illinois and read it and it changed her life. And she went to church, started asking the pastor, can I teach this? So they started setting, so they didn't want her to do it, but they set somebody else up to teach it. And they started teaching. He said, Brother Kinsey, the pastor was telling me at camp meeting this past year, he said, Brother Kinsey, it's revolutionized our church. We're growing. All through COVID, we've been growing. People are excited about Jesus. They're not scared anymore. I wish somebody would pick up their Bible and say, I'm going to read it every day. I wish somebody would find them a place and say, I'm going to pray every day. I wish somebody would just go ahead and let the devil know I'm not going to be intimidated and just start running and start praising God and lifting your hands and jumping and getting out and saying, this is my church. This is what I believe. This is who I am. I knew you were a hard man. Where in the Bible do you find that? That God is a hard man. Where do you find that he does not? Where's that concept at? He developed it somewhere. Don't know where. The Bible doesn't tell us. But wherever he developed that, it was wrong. And it bound the talent. And it had energy to produce. And it did nothing. Now I want you. If you want to take your talent and invest it in the kingdom and make your mind up. I'm going to start right now investing in the kingdom. I want you to come to the front, and I want you to gather around. It's commitment time. Thank God for the concepts that have kept me. Never give up. That's a concept. Hallelujah. There are people that text me or email me about before they go on a fast because they want my covering and my blessing. In some cases, I'll instruct them as to how to do it to where they don't injure and hurt their bodies because it's quite long fast. And so I'll instruct them. But I'm not going to get in the way of their fasting just because I don't feel called to, be, to do that at that particular time. That doesn't mean I can't bless them to do it. Because I've done enough. I've done that. And I'm going to still fast. I'll fast when, when I can. I'll fast when I can. When God calls me. But I'm not going to get in somebody else's way. And when somebody's got a good report of a great revival and a lot of people getting the Holy Ghost, just because I wasn't there doesn't mean I'm going to criticize it. What are you doing that for? What, 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 what. And I've had him do it all my life. I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to say, yeah, man. Let's do it for Jesus. Hallelujah. That's the concept you need to get. That's the concept you need to have. And it'll serve you well. It releases the talent. It unleashes the energy. It produces multiplication when you can get that concept. I choose it. And, and you have to choose sometimes over and over again because the devil will challenge it. Trust me. So I want you to connect with somebody around you and I want you to commit your life to investing your talent in the kingdom. I've got, I, it's not how much you've got. It's whether or not you give it and put it in the right hands. Put it in the right environment. Seed has power to multiply. You don't have to make it happen. You just got to make sure the conditions are right. That you place it where it can grow. Climate, soil, all of that.
I don't want to have to fight my brothers and sisters to defeat the Ammonites. I want you to come to the help of the Lord and make up in your mind every time you come to the house of God, you're going to fight on behalf of the kingdom. your life right now. Don't bury that talent. Get rid of those wrong concepts right now. In the name of Jesus, that's it. Would you pray for somebody near you right now? Would you pray for somebody that's around you? Pray for somebody around you right now as they sing and worship. Let God minister unto you. You can get those concepts changed. You can get those concepts changed. Listen, that man had eternal consequences attached to the wrong concept. You've got to have the right concept. Eternity is at stake. Your family, your relationships, what God wants to do in your life, your destiny is attached to your concepts. Reach out unto the Lord right now with all your heart. Reach out unto the Lord and seek his face right now. Seek the Lord while he can be found. Call upon his name in this house. Call upon the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's it. Press on. Press into the presence of God. Let it change your heart and change your mind right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Come on, you can be set free. You can be set free. You can be loose from those wrong concepts that are destructive to your relationship with God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Reach out unto the Lord. 